Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Hey, a quick note. Um, now that I'm fully vaccinated, uh, I'm going to take advantage of that. We're going to have a jailbreak. So I will be taking a short one week hiatus from uh, both the podcast and my daily newsletter, Morning Shots. We're going to go visit the family out east. So um, I, you know, hang in there. Try not to uh, ruin the country while, uh, while while I'm off, and then I'll be back a week from this coming Monday. And so, joining us on the podcast is another one of our vaccinated colleagues, Bill Crystal. But you know, happy Happy Friday, Bill. Uh, well, to you too, Charlie. And uh, it's going to be tough for the listeners to do without you for a week. But <laughs> they need to be reassured that you're coming back. It's not some kind of, uh, you know, Lou Gehrig type situation, not to make light of no. that, obviously, because that was a terrible tragedy. To, but, you know, <laughs> no, you... this is just a road trip. No Lou Gehrig type thing. Good, 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 just good. It. Well, enjoy, enjoy the road trip. Enjoy being unvaccinated. As you and I discussed in the past, it's we've been, I guess, I mean, enjoy being vaccinated. We've been vaccinated for, I don't know, maybe, you know, three weeks since fully vaccinated so to speak and it took it takes i found it so psychologically it takes a while to assimilate that you kind of are vaccinated and you can really if you're seeing someone else who's vaccinated or frankly even if you're not even if that other person isn't you are and in our case our wives are and so you don't quite have to be quite as like gee well i'd love to get together let's have coffee outside let's look at the weather to make sure it's a decent day before we go out on the deck and then it's like wait why am i going outside i'm not either going to hopefully catch anything or trans did anything right and you know and since we're back since i'm vaccinated and it, it takes a while psychologically to assimilate it does and it's interesting you said that because you know i i have this kind of mental block about it I'll, i will get over it i'll get over it very very quickly but uh i think i've been we've both been vaccinated for more than a month now i think i had my first shot and i think it was uh february 1st and then was a month later march 1st so it's been it's been more than a month and i haven't gone indoors to a restaurant yeah mm. so I, I i will i will get over he yeah, I did before. last week and it's it's, it's it is nice. there's something insane about how fantastic it feels after 13 yeah. months to have <laughs> have someone pour you a second cup of coffee it's like wow this is this was breakfast this is like this is the lap of luxury you know having you know eggs over 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 easy and and uh and home fries and and someone pouring you coffee so well that's what i'm looking forward to is 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 learning is the getting back to life and learning to appreciate getting back to life more like little things like that before we start hey i gotta thank you um you mentioned I think the last time you were on the podcast, you know, a couple of shows that you'd been watching or maybe it was uh -huh. a different podcast you were on, but you, you mentioned Broadchurch. Yes. And my wife and I watched that and we watched all three seasons. And I have to say that was an outstanding choice. So I appreciate it very much. And I think you also mentioned the French uh, uh, series Spiral, which I have not yet gotten, but I'm getting lots of emails from people who heard you recommend that who are also saying that that was excellent. So Spiral, I, so I'm really glad you like Broadchurch, which I think very is much. one of the best that I've seen of the kind of British police types. Hinterland is very much like it. If, if Hinterland. You like, yes, which is set in Wales. And um, and then Spiral, we've watched a few episodes of it. It's, it's a little uh, grisly, I guess you'd say, kind of a little darkish, you know, which is okay. And it's sort of that, that's the whole theme, thesis of it almost is, the, you know, it's the underside of Paris, not the Paris the tourists see. And, and of course, you get to see people speaking French, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. You can pre pretend your French is getting better, even though you're reading the subtitles and stuff. So um, actually, we, we, we started watching another British series. I'm not going to blank on the name. It's two women detectives, um, hmm. Bailey and something. I'll, I'll okay. look it up. It's good, actually. We're just in the first season. But it's funny, I'm so late to this, and I didn't really watch much of these, you know, uh, TV improved, and I noticed 20 years later that there was a whole new world of Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO series that were actually at the same quality or maybe higher quality, don't you think, than movies at this point? Oh, so there's no, there, oh, there's no question about it. It's yeah. it, We're in a golden age. The thing about that surprised me about Broadchurch was, uh, I, and look, I, I like British mysteries, but sometimes they're a little bit too mild. You know, my, yeah. my taste runs a little bit more for Ozark and something like like that. My, my wife, you know, likes the, you know, milder, no guns, no, no, no blood sort of thing. But Broadchurch was so intense, was way more intense than your average British murder mystery, um, and it what it is not as grisly or graphic as as an Ozark, but we it really you know captured you know our attention. We binged through 
season two and season three in just a couple of nights. And we generally don't do that sort of thing. I mean, it, it, it is, uh, it, it, it's smart. It's well acted It's well written It's well conceived. And so anyway, I highly recommend it. Okay. So Bill, I'm, before we get into other things, I am obsessed with this whole fundraising scam story that uh, the New York times reported over the weekend and the Tim Miller uh, advance in the bulwark yesterday and, and, and I know that you and I both have seen many, many, many fundraising scams over the year and, and understand there's there, there's a dark underbelly of fundraising, right? I mean, let's be honest about it. This is uh, most fundraising appeals are not put together by nuns sitting in a room with ethicists, right? I mean, it's uh, but the story over the weekend. So here's the, the original one, you know, about how the Trump campaign scammed its supporters into making these uh, recurring contributions draining the bank accounts of some of the most vulnerable supporters, including retirees. And basically what it was was they would use these these pre-checked boxes so that that if you donated $50 or $100, you were then required to manually opt out of uh, making these ongoing contributions. And they, and they made it more and more complicated to do this. And this was intentional on their part, right? I mean, you know, they were facing a cash crunch. And so they began it started in September, set up these recurring donations by default for online donors every week until the election. And there's just some really just horrible stories of people living in hospice care and veterans who ended up, you know, losing thousands of dollars. In the end, the Trump campaign had to make refunds of more than one hundred and twenty two million dollars, which is huge. And so that was horrific. That was that was the weekend. So you fast forward to yesterday. And our Tim Miller in the Bulwark has this fantastic story about how the National Republican Congressional Committee is doing the exact same thing, continuing to do it with these amazing wrinkles. So you have a fundraising appeal and it says you have to make this contribution $50, $100, $250, $500,000 for the Congressional Committee. And then they have these two pre-checked boxes. And I have to read them because you can't make it up. It's checked. We need your help to draft Trump for president, exclamation point. Check this box if you want Trump to run again. Uncheck this box if you do not stand with Trump. And then, of course, if you check it, then then your donation becomes monthly recurring. And then the other box is Trump patriot status missing. As a top grassroots supporter, we were surprised to see you abandoned him. This is your last chance to activate your stat to update your status to active. So I don't know where do you want to weigh in? I mean, just the, the the fact that it's a scam is is one thing. The the fact that the congressional committee is basically using your loyalty to Trump and getting you to try to support Trump to run for president in 2024. I mean, that's that's kind of amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, so two points. The first that the, the name of the show I mentioned that you should watch. If I could just get, <laughs> uh, once you once you, now that you finish with Broad Church and once you finish with Hinterland, which is also very intense, is Scott and Bailey. They're two women uh, detectives. Excellent. Okay, and, Scott and um, they're five seasons, and it's sort of not as intense quite as Broad Church, but less, but more, but more intense than your old fashioned British. And, and if and if you don't watch it, it's proof you don't love America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Scott and Bailey. Yeah, it's good. It's a little, I think they sold it as like, wow, it's all women, you know, women, not all women, but I mean, the two, these two protagonists are both women. So it's one so accustomed to the the pairs, right? The, the man okay. and the woman. But it's actually very, it's very interesting and quite psychologically, I think, astute. Okay. I mean, for me, there's a lot of scams online and, and fundraising, God knows, and all this, but, um, and, and some of them are legal and some are quite, the fact that the Trump campaign, I think what people should focus on is, uh, campaigns sometimes do well. A, they do return money if requested. Sometimes if they've misled people, and there's a little bit of this recurring donation stuff going on. No, I don't know of any major campaign, any you know national level campaign that's returned 120 million dollars. I think they raised something like six or seven hundred million. So like they had to return a fifth of the money. And again, they, this wasn't the FEC. To my knowledge, it wasn't the FEC coming in and telling them they had to. It's their own people, so their own supporters. So Could not have been ripped off. Me. People yeah. who wanted to give money to 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 Trump, saying, "Wait, I've been ripped off by the person I wanted to give money to," and I didn't realize I was giving, you know, making a monthly contribution. And then for the and then so that's that's widely denounced. It's reported they give them they had to give all that money back. 
uh, they gave that money back. And then the NRCC just picks right up on doing it. And of course, all the talk about how we're just the congressional committee. We want to have a, you need to have a Republican House because we need to make sure Biden doesn't pursue socialism. But then their selling point obviously is, is Trump. It's all about don't betray Trump, don't desert Trump. And even as you say, Trump 2024. So what about all that liberation from Trump? What about how you don't have to be a Trumpy person to donate? You can just be some old fashioned Republican who thinks, you know, the Republican economic policies are better. They've tested what's for me the final point. What's revealing though is these things are tested, of course, very elaborately and carefully, right? Which appeal works better? They they do simultaneously simultaneous tests, beta tests, whatever you want to call it, of of all these different appeals and different boxes and checks. It's clear the Trump appeals work. That's very revealing, isn't it? I mean, right. for those of us, unfortunately, for those of us who would hope, well, there's a lot of Republican voters out there, maybe more particularly the kind who give money, you know, who, you know, they want the more traditional Republican-ish tax and other kinds of, you know, appeals. Uh, um, no, they the, the people who are writing the check, sending in the money on their credit cards want the want the Trump appeals. I guess the Marjorie Taylor Greene, you probably followed this more closely than I, those numbers were pretty astounding too, right? In terms of her fundraising. Yeah. And that's why this is relevant because this is the center of gravity of Republican fundraising or maybe all political fundraising right now, online fundraising and and what, what shakes money loose from people's hands. So, okay. Uh, this actually gets worse. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I read to you the first two, two boxes and uh, Tim actually added to his story yesterday afternoon. He says, if you can believe it, there's an even worse version of this running on the NRCC's fundraising page where they actually threaten to tell Trump that you are a defector. That's the word they use, all in caps, defector. If they uncheck the box for recurring donations, they have to read it. Okay, now keep in mind, this is aimed at their people, their supporters. These are people who have already written out checks or given their credit card to give money for Republican congressional candidates, but they still threaten them. We need to know, we haven't lost you to the radical left. If you uncheck this box, all in caps, we will have to tell Trump you're a defector, all in caps, and sided with the Dems. Check this box and we can win back the House and get Trump to run in 2024. And this makes it a monthly recurring donation. I mean, wow, you're a defector. So you've given $250 to Republican congressional committees, but we're going to rat you out to the former guy and say that you've aligned with the radical left because you're a defector if you don't make this a recurring contribution. I mean, it's just, but it's this, this, I mean, as I wrote in my newsletter, great googly moogly. I mean, really, this is just, what do you say about this except that? they've tested this and apparently this is what works. This is intentional. This is purposeful and maybe crude, but this is, this apparently is what works. This kind of threat works with the grassroots or they think it does. I mean, it's got a, there's a Gresham's law, I guess. I think that's the right use of that term in political rhetoric, which is, you know, it, if, if one thing gets normalized, things then get worse, everything gets more debased. And Trump himself, of course, let's not forget, normalized the use of the word, words like traitor in, attack, in attacking the opposition party, incidentally, on very mild things where they differed, actually, where the Democrats and Congress mm -hmm. are mild, but I mean, normal policy differences. Um, and, 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 and people like us said, oh my God, this is a new low. That's a word that's used very rarely and when used, usually criticized, or maybe when used, used for really, uh, you know, very intense foreign policy differences at the height of the Cold War yeah. and so forth. And now they're using it routinely to attack the opposition. And God knows he's, he uses millions of other words like that, including implying they're not real Americans and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the, the sophisticated defenders of Trump, the uh, conservative elites and stuff, well, okay, that's Trump. I don't know prove of that. But of course, it, it's going to be contained to Trump and none of the rest of us would do that. And here we are, it's now normalized in the Republican Congressional Committee appeals and normalized. Obviously, you look at the rhetoric of the candidates, Josh Mandel, whom I knew a mm -hmm. little bit, was totally- Running for Senate in Ohio. Yeah. yeah, Republican running, young, ambitious Republican running in Ohio and one state treasurer twice, lost a couple of Senate uh, bids, one, one I think he pulled out of and lost one, but, um, and now is attacking, uh, not Democrats incidentally, but Anthony Gonzalez, a Republican congressman who voted to impeach Trump as a matter of a, a true courageous vote, a conscientious vote, um, but a pretty conservative Republican otherwise, 
uh, attacking him. I think literally used the word traitor. As a tr- yeah, yeah, treason, traitor. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so it it does, you know, it it it's hard to get that toothpaste back in the tube of, you know, could we have a civilized politics? It really is hard, and and it spills over now. Some people are resisting it, and some people just don't. They don't criticize it, but they don't quite go there themselves. You know, that would be more the Mitch McConnell types, I suppose. But you know what? It ter- this is the, for me the big lesson. We've discussed this a bit in the past, but it's a new a new version of it almost. You know, if you don't criticize it. It gets worse. You can't take the position of right. a benign neglect, or you know, I'm just not. Well, we tr- we, we tried that. Best. You know, right. I don't want to be in the middle yeah. of that. Well, that's a very nice, fastidious thing to do. And in your personal life, you have no obligation to get in the middle of things you think are stupid and and unattractive, and you know, just let other people fight them out. Uh, and sometimes in politics, that's okay, I guess, if you think they're going to kind of wear each other out or something. But in this case, when the fate of a major, one of our two major political parties, is at stake, it is not acceptable. It turns out it's. Not not responsible to sort of do nothing. No, I we we had we had tried that. So I wonder if whether defector is going to be the new term, which by the way is kind of like a throwback to the Cold War, isn't it? Yeah, you, know, you yeah, defect to the Soviet so. Union. The Soviet Union, def- you know, somebody from the Soviet Union defected to us. It's not the kind of word that comes up in daily conversation, and yet this is it that we will have to tell Trump you're a defector. And decide sided with the Democrat. The stupidity of this is is on one level, but also, and I said this yesterday. I I think that this really reflects the the GOP's deep contempt for its own voters. Yeah, that they that they think of them as 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 marks and as rubes, and they're willing to to try that. And I so it, it's the assumption on the part of the elites, like the Kevin McCarthy's of the world, the people running the Republican Party, that. That uh, that they that they can rip off their grassroots in this particular way. So you saw the Gallup poll uh, yesterday. The yeah. uh, the Gallup poll showing that through the first quarter of the year, an average of forty nine percent of Americans identified with the Democrats or said they were in, uh, or said they were independents who leaned toward the Democrats. Compares with forty percent who identified as Republicans or leaners. The nine-point Democratic edge is the largest Gallup has measured since the fourth quarter of 2012. In recent years, Democratic advantages have typically been between four and six percentage points. So this would at least be one one data point suggesting the Republican Party going in this particular way is shrinking. Although I have to mention, you know, it's it's hit this low in 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 the past and been able to bounce back. But 40 percent is a warning sign for Republicans. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's funny. I did a conversation uh, with James Carville yesterday morning, which will be released actually later today, later or yes, I'm not sure what exactly, but it, it should be uh, up on the internet uh, uh, when people hear this podcast. And so that's a audio and video conversation, mm-hmm. conversations with Bill Crystal. People can go to that and, and take a look. And um, we've done a zillion of them, as you know, Charlie, over the mm-hmm. years, and I've done them and every two weeks, release them. Uh, often academics and other t- economists, but this is with James on politics and very interesting on the Democrats. He's quite alarmed about the left wing of the Democratic Party, hmm. but also sort of optimistic about Biden and very hard headed about the current political situation. One thing I asked him, well, what polling questions do you look at just to help people kind of get a more sophisticated grasp of what's happening? And he's mentioned that one. He said, the one thing I like to look at always, and I always put it in my own polls, uh, when I'm doing polls, and is wh- how do you self-identify? And huh. you obviously give them a choice, strong Democrat, weak Democrat, leading Democrats, uh, something like that. You push the independents when they say independent. Well, you're sure you're not leading one way or the other. So you try to get a real sense of the, you don't let people just get away with saying, well, I don't like either party. You say, well, which way do you lean? Now, still, you get about 10, 12 percent who say, I don't like either party. But uh, And he said, he mentioned this, he's seen this in a couple of polls. He said around a plus 10, plus nine a Democratic edge, and that that's pretty high. It's not you know, super, super, you know, dispositively dis- dis- high, but it is uh, it is stronger than the average four to six Democratic. It's strong. And if you just think of the race, Biden won by what, 5%. I think Democrats mm-hmm. won the House national vote by about three and a half or 4%, I think. So uh, maybe Biden was four and a half percent in the popular vote. I can't remember. So, you know, if you think of that as kind of a benchmark, uh, then 9% would suggest some movement towards Biden since election day, presumably driven, or towards the Democrats, since election day, presumably driven by um, 
maybe by January 6th, maybe by Republican craziness, maybe by Biden, you know, doing a pretty good job on the vaccines and whatnot. I mean, you can look at it both ways. In a certain way, part of me thinks really, it's like it only moved four or five percentage points after the craziness of the last five months, you know, but but it is a real movement. So it, they're paying some price. It makes me wonder, you know, this is actually, speaking of the conversations with Bill Crystal, Andy Zwick, whom, you know, I think I've met, he's mm-hmm. the kind of producer of them. Uh, and he's very interested in politics, of course. And He's had this speculation for a few months that maybe it's all bad. Of course, what's happening with the Republicans and he reads uh, your newsletter and JVL Mm -hmm. and everything and Bulwark Plus member and was totally in agreement. But he also wonders, could it be a bit of a bubble? I mean, it's gotten so crazy. It's sort of like, you know, we've discussed this maybe in the past too, that, you know, these, these, you know, you start, these things start off and, and then they go longer than you think. And they go to more extreme extremes than you think. That's very true of stock market bubbles, right? Uh, but eventually it kind of pops. And how much – can this get more and more crazy? Are more and more Senate candidates going to accuse Republicans who don't agree, who aren't worshiping Trump of being defect traders? And uh, is more and more fundraising emails going to go out accusing everyone who doesn't you know, keep renewing, keep sending in 50 bucks a month of being a defector and 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 – does this culture war craziness just get worse and worse and worse? Maybe it does. I mean, that's the question. Or maybe it's permanently the way it is. Could there be some point where people just look up a year from now and it's Biden's been president and the world, and you know, they don't like some of the policies and the government's sloshing out too much money, but we're not living in a socialist country. We're not living in an unfree country. Uh, foreign policy is pretty mainstream. And people look up and say, you know, some of that that was a little crazy. Some of that stuff. I mean, I don't. That's that's his suspicion that that could happen, or maybe it's his hope. <laughs> but I don't know. Do you think it could be kind of a, you know, a, you know, it, it, it could it, be, it, could the craziness of the right be kind a bit of a bubble? You know, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with somebody. I, I would I would mention them, but I, it was a private conversation, and they made the similar point about about political bubbles that they tend to burst right at right after they appear to be unstoppable. <laughs> that they grow and they grow and they grow and they become very, very confident and it looks like they have become dominant and that's when they they burst. And you think about what's going on right now where you have all of the craziness, it appears to be dominant. And so Republicans, what they're doing is they're, of course, all doubling down, going further and further, you know, calling people who disagree with them traitors. Uh, the, the craziness appears to be, well, it, it appears to be required at, at some point is that unsustainable? And of course, our fear is, well, because we've lived with the growth so long that maybe it will be sustainable. But the reality is, is that, look, you know, unless the entire country loses its mind, you know, they're going to pay a price for this. Now, is it possible that the country could lose its mind? I mean, that that is possible, right? I, you know, I I was telling you that I was considering making my next book, The Idiocy of Everything. (laughs) <laughs> um, but, but I don't know where you go past the title. It's one of those titles that just sort of covers everything, right? You don't actually need to read the book because it, it, it's right. there. But yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's true. So let's talk about the politics of infrastructure because and it occurs to me that the two political parties have completely different theories of the case. The Democrats mm-hmm. believe that if they grow the economy, pass substantive legislation, put money in people's pockets, send them checks, build things, that they will be rewarded by the electorate. The Republicans think that it's not about economics at all anymore, that it's all about culture war. It's all about attacking the elitism and playing the grievance cards. And that even if the economy comes back and even if they build bridges and all of that stuff, that they will successfully be able to run on, I'm, this has become so old now, cancel culture, woke corporate corporations, et cetera, and that it is the cultural issues that are still moving people, hearts and minds, more than the actual substance of legislation or money, that it's no longer, that it's not the economy stupid anymore. What do you think? I mean, it is the right question to ask, and I think you're you're right in characterizing the, the bulk of the two parties. Obviously, the, the, the woke left has its version of a performative um, uh, kind of culture war symbolism and think that that's the right way to do politics and think they deserve credit for screaming and yelling on their side. I mean, the Biden people are old fashioned and thinking that, you know, you should probably should judge most of these policies by their consequences. And are they actually, you know, are the vaccines getting out or not? And will these economic 
you know, they're willing to be judged, I think, by the consequences of their economic plans. People like you and me think there's probably too much money there and it's sort of a little overdone here and the, uh, you know, Keynesianism on steroids. But, you know, they'd say, fine, let's let's pass it and see. And I think they would say in a grown up way, we, this is the we're making it you know, a judgment here, a practical judgment that we're, there's a greater risk of spending too little than too much, or we've underspent in infrastructure, whatever arguments they make, they're familiar political argu policy arguments, and one could make the counter arguments. You know, on the culture can be important. I, I don't think, I don't think, well, one other thing I'd say is, so yes, against that, there's a kind of performative politics, which is taken over two thirds of the Republican Party, and maybe a third of the Democratic Party, which generally is unhealthy, I would say. I mean, there are real cultural issues, if you want to call call them cultural, uh, which are legitimate issues. I mean, yeah. is there going to be a Hyde Amendment or not? Are we, is the federal government going to pay for uh, abortions or not? Obviously, marriage was an issue. I think it's kind of over, but it was a legitimate issue on which people differed. And there was a sort of old view and a new view. And so, it's, But what's striking is that we're not even at that level of discussion. Some of that was always a little bit kind of uh, performative, you might say, or symbolic. Um, but it was also had real policy consequences, whereas now... I mean, the, there are policy consequences. So you have Republican legislatures passing bills on something like transgender issues, which are, I think, somewhat complicated. And I wouldn't claim to have studied the medical literature and so forth. But I'm tell you what, these Republican legislators sure as heck haven't studied any medical literature or frankly talked to anyone who's gone, the family who's had to make some decisions about- I think that's a fair assumption. 17 yeah. year olds. And they're just passing stuff. So that really is, I think, a, another level of of- perniciousness, you know? I mean, I suppose there's always been a little bit of that. If you were tough on crime, you found some way to symbolize that by, you know, three strikes, you're out or something. But again, it was, those were not, those are still, other people could say, well, wait a second, shouldn't you make it, you know, 20 years, not life in prison, I, whatever. I mean, you know, there's something creep. there's something really, not just creepy, but dangerous, I'd say, when your politics becomes entirely a matter of gesture and performance and symbolism. And uh, one reason, look, this was the original neoconservative and the very old fashioned sense of it, 50 year old sense, a uh, critique of the left. They were, didn't care. You'd show this poverty program doesn't work and they would, they didn't care because they wanted to say they were passing poverty programs. And that is not a healthy way to run a country because ultimately you end up with a lot of programs that don't work and are counterproductive and the same with education and a lot of other areas. And that's become, I think the Biden people to their credit, mostly have accepted in a way that critique and 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 they're sort of trying to find things that they think will work with a fair amount of some identity politics thrown in obviously and and all that but the degree to which the right to think of that so they have this massive government stimulus program which is susceptible to a lot of good old-fashioned conservative republican policy arguments, both economic policy, but also how are you going to spend that money? Do you have confidence that the institutions know right. how to spend it well? Work. Didn't you try to do it in an incremental way? I mean, very normal kind of common sense, moderately conservative arguments. We're hearing almost none of that, are we? I mean, I, I, is any Republican congressman given a speech where he's laid out, <laughs> I, you know, where he said, well, you the I, you like, I like parts one, three, and six of this bill. I think part five is okay, but it spends too much. Parts two and four are just a mistake, and here's why. The money's not going to solve what you think it's going to solve. Does that discourse even exist in Republican circles or, frankly, even in most conservative circles anymore? Well, I think the discourse right now is to say that it's not all the infrastructure, focusing on the word infrastructure. Right. So, for for example, Marsha Blackburn famously had a series of tweets where she said, you know, they, they are spending, you know, X billions of dollars on you know, care for the elderly. That's not infrastructure. What what she doesn't then go on and explain is why caring for the elderly is a bad thing. Right. I mean, that's what she got dunked on. It's like, okay, so not everything is infrastructure. And, you know, speaking of dumbing down the issue, you know, Kirsten Gillibrand, Gillibrand from New York had that silly tweet yesterday. Paid leave is infrastructure. Child care is infrastructure. Caregiving is infrastructure. And and I understand that people, you know, the Democrats rally around her and say, look, look, don't, don't, don't leech all meaning out of the words, because if, if everything is infrastructure, then the word means nothing, then unicorns are infrastructure. Um, on the other hand, as, as you point out, the Republicans are having a hard time explaining why these things are bad. Okay, so you may say um, broadband is not infrastructure. I think it is infrastructure. But is that a bad thing? Are we against putting in broadband? And this is also part of this weird incoherence where the Republicans want to be the working class party 
but it's not clear what they ever actually want to do for the working class. Have you noticed this? Right. That, that, that everything about the working class appears to be the culture war stuff, not stuff like, hey, let's get you a job building bridges, you know, laying train tracks. Uh, let's let's expand the minimum wage or create more paid leave programs or things that would actually change the 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 working class, except to play into their sense of grievance, the fact that the elitists don't like you, et, et cetera. But no, we're not really having a substantive debate on on infrastructure. Could I go back to the, the point you made, though, for, for some of our listeners? I think it's important. This, you know, politics as virtue signaling, because mm-hmm. you hit one of my buttons. You know, um, back in the 60s and 70s, I, you know, I, I grew up in a liberal household, a very, very liberal democratic household. And, um, you know, really, you know, grew up, actually being an activist and young Democrats. And uh, but one of the things that began to disillusion me was watching how good intentions often had unintended consequences. So, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, you had a lot of people on the left supported programs that were disasters that actually ended up hurting the people they were designed to help, whether it's urban renewal or some AFDC. And when you pointed out that that hey you know this actually is destroying these communities or making people's lives less well off you know you'd often get the the blowback well y- you know you shouldn't judge it on that basis you should judge it on on the basis of our good intentions we are you know we are the good guys we need to do virtuous things and therefore there was a sense that they didn't really care about the actual real world implications so when you're talking about you know politics as virtue signaling A lot of conservatives now remember when it was the left that was willing to embrace just disastrous policies because they cloaked themselves in their good intentions. And and a lot of conservatism was a critique of that, which, again, makes it ironic that now the right has become the party of just sort of performative virtue signaling. And I think from the point of view of democratic self-governance, there's always, of course, there's always going to be some of that. And intentions do matter as well. And so you're – but – a healthy country, a healthy, uh, well-governed country has to care about the actual consequences of policies and, and maybe not – it can also care about intentions and about sing- signaling a little bit. And um, and that is – you just look at this debate. I think if someone came down from Mars and looked at our current debate on a major set of economic proposals and compared it with the debate of 1981 about Reagan or, or in the 60s about the Great Society uh, or in the 2000s for that matter about, I don't know, Medicare, Plan D or whatever, you know, or even Obamacare, honestly. I mean, those were actual policy debates. And there was a lot of argument about would Obamacare actually help the people who claim to and would the exchanges work well or not? And then you still couldn't choose your doctor. There's a certain amount of of just symbolic kind of uh, screaming and yelling on both sides and, and invocations of virtue by the Democrats. One reason people like me, incidentally, I, I suspect in retrospect, were even unwilling to think about the arguments for Obamacare as much as maybe we should have or elements of Obamacare is it was so annoying, all the virtue signaling on the left, right? That you had to yeah, be for right. this because otherwise you didn't care that 30 million Americans didn't have health insurance and might not get the health care they deserve. And it was annoying being told that. And you would say, wait a second, those people can get health care. We should look at ways to help them get it better. But this is going to be, this is an inefficient and, and, and sometimes counterproductive way of helping them. And then they would scream at you that you didn't care about people who, you know, who had a pre-existing condition and were and were having trouble getting the, 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 work, the help they needed. So the virtue signaling on the left probably you know, in a way, I think hurt them among some people, at least in terms of taking their policy seriously. And now we have such virtue signaling on the right and such performative politics on the right that I worry, I mean, will anyone ever be able to make a limited government, free market, incentives matter type type argument again? And will anyone listen? Or are they interested in doing it? I mean, so you wrote about Matt Gates today, and I don't want to spend the whole podcast on, on, on Matt Gates, but it's kind of a symbol of this performative politics where, you know, Matt Gates, you know, uh, you know, wrote in his book that if you're not making news, you're not governing. And, you know, like of this whole new generation, these are not people who appear to have, they're in office, but they're not that interested in governing. They're not interested in legislative outcomes. They're certainly not interested in legislating. It is all just performative. It, it's all brand, no actual substance. 
And again, there have always been people like that, and they usually were sort of on the fringes of their parties. Some of them were, were you know, they were show horses, not work horses, right? That was kind of the inside, that was the term that was used. Some of the show horses, you know, became pretty famous, and I suppose they were show horses so they could run for president and all that. And so you always have a mix of show horses and work horses, but the mix is, is, is now so skewed, somewhat skewed in both parties, I've got to say, and somewhat skewed in our culture as a whole, of course. But so much more on, on the right. That, and again, the, the whole point of the conservatism, in a sense, was to to try to – the, the critique of the left was exactly that there's – where are the workhorses? And, and now it, that's just it's really disappeared. I mean, it's really shocking how it's – the degree to which it, the whole concept is sort of gone so far as I can tell from Republicans in the House – with like five, two exceptions, you know, and um, and and not 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 much stronger in the Senate either, and even Republican governors. So governors are the ones who really were uh, mm-hmm. workhorses. They actually governed states, and they would be judged by results. And now we have you know governors of major major states, Greg Abbott in Texas. You know, you'd think okay, Texas has done pretty well so far as I vaguely can tell, and I mean leaving aside COVID, but you know in terms of economic policy and people, are, you know, companies are flocking there, and Austin's booming, and Houston, and you'd think that okay, that's a pretty impressive case for Republican governance, I would guess. And uh, maybe I remember, in fact, you and I are old enough to remember when it was a kind of a very standard, but I think somewhat. Good conservative talking point that let's just compare Texas and California. These are oh, two yeah. states. It's they cool. have nice climates mostly. You know, they both have a lot of immigration. They have a lot of things in common. Um, and they've pursued sort of different policies because of the politics of the two states. And let's see where people are moving to and where business is going towards and who's doing a better job. And Texas isn't perfect, God knows. But, you know, it was a pretty reasonable argument for Texas. You know, and Rick Perry, who we now think of sort of a somewhat goofball politician, but actually tried to make that argument when he was running for president. You know, look at my actual record as governor of Texas. And now, I mean, you don't even get a word of that, right, from from Governor Abbott or, or DeSantis in Florida much either. No, and, and they have become they've become very, very showy. So okay, let's talk about John Boehner, speaking <laughs> of, of 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 folks. Okay, so the former speaker he has this new book out. I haven't read the book, but there's a long excerpt in the New York Times today. And, uh, you know, here, here's a guy who uh, really lived through the, uh, the crack up of the Republican Party, really were driven out of the speakership by, um, you know, by, uh, you know, some of the, the people who became the Trumpiest folks. So he's got the new, the new book's going to come out this week. And it's, uh, it, it has a stinging denunciation of Trump saying that uh, the Trump incited the bloody insurrection on January 6th, and the Republican Party has been taken over by whack jobs. Let me just go a little bit. Some of these these quotes here. He said, um, he re- writes that Trump's refusal to accept the results of the election not only cost the Republicans the Senate, but led to mob violence, saying it was painful to watch. He said, I'll admit I was not prepared for what came after the election. Trump refusing to accept the results and stoking the flames of conspiracy that turned into violence in the seat of our democracy, the building over what uh, the uh, over which I once presided. Watching it was scary and sad. It should have been a wake up call for a return to Republican sanity. Whatever they end up doing or not doing, none of it will compare to one of the lowest points in American democracy that we lived through in January 2021. So then he goes through, and he obviously is very, very critical of uh, of other Republicans. So your 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 thoughts? He's writing this book now. Um, but, I mean, but he, you know. I, I imagine it's an entertaining book, and I there's probably some genuine, uh, you know, uh, lessons to be learned from it. Some some perceptive analyses of things. He's an intelligent guy. He was in the middle of stuff, uh, and I'm glad he's saying what he's saying about January 6th and the Republican Party now. I mean, I wish he had said it a little more forcefully. I, I'm sure he said something on January 6th or 7th. I don't remember, but I don't remember him on January 13th calling congressman with whom we serve, members of Congress with whom we served, including from the state of Ohio. The, but of course, there are many with whom we served as speaker and many who were close to him and saying, you know what, you should vote to impeach this man. And I don't remember him saying that to Rob Portman, his senator from Ohio, on, on when the Senate voted to, uh, on conviction. So uh, and in general, I don't remember him being that outspoken over the last five years about the threat of Trump. And in fact, our friend Amanda Carpenter has you know, dug up a couple of very nice things he said about Trump in 2016 and certainly yeah. 
endorsed him. I think 2020, he may have just sort of sat out. One of his aides said, oh, he wouldn't he get did. involved in this mess for any- Well, that's right. I mean, now he had a chance to speak out in 2020 when, when it was on the line. Right. And clearly he had no illusions about the Republican Party or Trump. And yet when he had a chance, he did not come out against Trump during the 2020 election. So- eh. And nor did Paul Ryan. And no. you know, this is maybe they didn't vote for him. But maybe they did, but whatever, they did nothing. And so, you know, I mean, you're in Wisconsin. I don't know. And it was close. And that was the closeness of those races made it easier uh, for Trump and, and the Republicans to sell the big lie. I mean, I'm not saying they wouldn't have tried even if he had lost the national vote by nine points and lost, instead of five, four or five and lost Wisconsin by 150,000 instead of 20. But it would have been easier, the bigger the margin. I don't know. Could Paul Ryan have moved some votes in Wisconsin? Could John Boehner have moved some votes? Could I don't know. Have moved some votes? Maybe not. Maybe no one was listening to these ex office holders. But I don't know. Kind of everyone should have tried, in my opinion. You know, and surely they all thought Biden would be a better choice than Trump, and 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 certainly now would agree that Biden, given January sixth especially, uh, and, and Trump's behavior after the election, was a better choice than Trump. And the, the, again, the, the quiet, the the the. the uh, crickets across the board and all that from these, uh, a lot of these ex big shots, not all of them. Um, I think that's been bad for the country. And I just think it's a failure. And not that everyone has to weigh in on everything. I understand that, but on a fundamental choice in 2020, uh, on a fundamental fact of the big lie, and now Banner is weighing in on that. So that's to his credit. But again, I'm not sure he did quite as much as he might have. Uh, I guess he's waiting for his book to come out, but uh, and I, but at the broader critique of the Republican establishment, the business establishment, conservative elites, I would very much make that there was a lot. The ones who kept quiet were better than the ones who acquiesced publicly and, and sort of justified, and they were in turn better than the ones who enthusiastically got all on board Trump and the big lie. But but even the silence, they could have done better. Well, the thing that's fascinating about Boehner, of course, is that he saw this crack up up close and personal uh, before he quit. And he, you know, he actually writes in the book, apparently, that you know, talking about the members of the House and Senate who supported Trump's efforts to overturn the election, he writes, some of the people involved did not surprise me in the least. The legislative terrorism that I'd witnessed as speaker had now encouraged actual terrorism. And so he he bailed out. I guess you think back on that and, you know, the all of the signs of the crack up of the Republican Party were there, and yet he was succeeded by Paul Ryan. So there was that sense that we weren't going in that direction. But Paul Ryan turns out to be a parenthesis rather than an inflection point, which obviously is is tough. So what do you make of this? We haven't had a chance to talk about this make of this uh, new uh, quote unquote war between the Republican Party and corporate America. Awfully interesting. Mitch McConnell, who you and I both uh, have known as the number one advocate for the free speech rights of American corporations, now turns on them and says they should stay out of politics. And if they keep getting involved in politics in the wrong way, which means not writing him checks, uh, that there will be dire consequences. What do you make of that? Again, they're discrediting uh, what's not a foolish argument, which is on the whole, it's better for corporations, you know, to kind of be restrained in their political activities and in their political virtue signaling. And, uh, you know, it just, you don't want the whole culture, the whole country to be politicized in every respect. And I would say the same about sports teams and sports leagues and so forth. Um, and there's a practical question. This is again, a very old fashioned consequences matter question, which Stacey Abrams actually was worried about, which is if Major League Baseball you know, they're, they have the right not to have the all-star game there. And there were some reasons to make that symbolic choice. They're also practically speaking, hurting so, quite a lot of people in the Atlanta area, many of whom are are, are minorities and uh, don't deserve to be hurt because uh, of, of something the Republicans jammed through the Georgia legislature. So, uh, you know, but now it's all, um, you know, against the Republicans have decided there was that memo uh, from the head of the, I think, Republican, it was from Banks from Indiana, uh, urging McCarthy, we've got to be the party of the working class. And it's all, sim it's either all nativism and anti-immigration and that kind of thing, or symbolic stuff. And there's no actual policies. So, I don't believe Mitch McConnell is going to embrace a lot of anti-corporate policies. In fact, they're going to pretend not to drink Diet Coke for a while, I suppose, and try to keep it's, – it's part very much of a piece, I guess, as we're coming to the end of this, I'll just say yeah. it this way. It's very much of a piece of what we, we began this podcast with, which you spoke about so well, which is the NRCC fundraising appeal. It's the exact same thing. It's all performative. It's all – 
lets them have the, the rubes, you know, can be convinced that we don't like corporations because we, uh, we're we going to criticize Coke and Delta. But let's not have a serious discussion about, I don't know, tax policy or anything like that. Right. No, it's it's going to be sort of a fake slap fight. You know, look, we're, you know, because not one Republican is going to vote to change the, the corporate tax policy. So, Bill Crystal, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it very much and have a great weekend. Thanks, Charlie, and have a great break. And we'll, we're eager to have you back, obviously, as, uh, as soon as you finish that break. Yes, and I and I will be be I'll be off next week, but I will be back a week from Monday. Thank you all for listening to this weekend's special Bulwark podcast.